Hey guys, it's Vitross, and welcome to the debut episode of From A to 24. The series where I do deep dives into A24 films starting from the very beginning, which means we're going to start with a glimpse inside the mind of Charles Swan III. Now I'm planning to make a video specifically to give you an overview of what all is covered in an episode from A to 24, but I'm kind of figuring out the format as I go, so I'll cover that later. But I think this is enough to get started with the first episode. Now you may have noticed that the movie is still shrink-wrapped, and that's because I haven't watched it yet. But before I sit down and watch it, I want to go ahead, give my impressions, what my expectations for the film are. And overall, I will say I'm not expecting a whole lot. I haven't really heard about the movie since I looked up, like, what was the first movie A24 ever made. So I don't think it's going to be really anything exceptional. But I am interested to see where A24 started. This movie was written and directed by Roman Coppola, the son of Francis Ford Coppola. And while I'm not familiar with really either of their movies, it is something that's kind of notable. But we'll see how the movie stands on its own. The movie features Charlie Sheen in what I think might be his first role after that whole crazy interview situation. And the movie also has Jason Schwartzman, who I'm always pleasantly surprised when I see him on screen, and also Bill Murray. Now in regards to the plot, I don't really know anything about it, but I believe the main character's name is Charles, and the third Charles of the Swan family to be precise. And I believe he is capable of thinking, and if we're lucky, maybe we'll get a little peek into what that looks like. But more seriously, I don't know a lot about it. It sounds like it's going to be very imaginative and more dreamlike, which I'm a little bit wary about, because I feel like it's going to make it harder to really be invested when everything's kind of not really reality. And hopefully, though, we get some interesting visuals with like the dreamlike storyline that I'm predicting is how it's going to be. I could be completely wrong, but I'm going to go ahead, give it a watch, and we'll find out. Now, first things first, I watched this movie on Blu-ray because I've heard you get better picture quality with disc than by streaming it, and I want to give this movie a fair shot. However, it's been quite a while since I've watched a movie on disc, and so I forgot that they have trailers before the movie, even though you've already bought the movie itself. But the trailers included in this film were a bit of an interesting collection, to say the least. It starts with Anger Management, Charlie Sheen's new sitcom since he got let go from Two and a Half Men, which makes sense to be included. But there's also a trailer for I Love You, Philip Morris, which came out three years before the movie that's being shown before. It also includes a trailer for the film Meatballs, which does include Bill Murray, and so does the movie that's being shown before, so that kind of makes sense. But the thing is, it's so old that I don't even have to look at the original date that the year came out in. I just need to tell you that in the trailer for Meatballs, Bill Murray looks like this. In the movie that we're actually watching, he looks like this. So I don't know why it was included, but it's an interesting choice to say the least. Now, I will say, I don't want to get too distracted by the trailers before even watching the movie that we're here for, but the best trailer would have to be The Beaver. Is Dad gone? He's not gone, honey. We just agreed that it's better if we don't live together anymore. I'm glad you kicked him out. What a loser. This is the story of Walter Black, a hopelessly depressed individual. So you can see that Walter is a man who's lost all hope. But he's about to find his voice. Bloody hell. Look at you. I'm sick. Do you want to get better? Who are you? No, I'm the beaver, Walter. And I'm here to save your damn life. <laughs> it's a joke, right? No, son. It's a fresh start. I'm not talking to you, nut job. I'm talking to mom. But I've been very patient. And I want you. Not him. This man is a dead end. He's gone. I fought for you, and I will continue to fight for you because I love you. Okay, stay on target. Stay on target. Let's get to the actual movie. The movie starts with the classic A24 logo animation, which is nice to know that they've been using it from the very beginning, before going to the opening credits where the editor is trying to use as many fonts as he can get away with, before it goes to the titular glimpse inside the mind of Charles Swan III. I'm not sure what exactly is allowed on YouTube, but let's not start episode one with the content strike. Okay, it looks like about 70% of your brain, this whole region here, is concerned pretty much exclusively with sex. And based on the rest of the movie, that kind of tracks. The movie introduces some of the characters in the film before diving into the plot. Charles, or Charlie as they often call him throughout the film, is going through a breakup because his girlfriend doesn't like the way that he stores the photos of her and the way he stores photos of his exes. You know, that's the drawer where I keep all my pictures. 
That's the drawer where we keep pictures of us. I don't want to be in the same fucking drawer as them. His girlfriend angrily storms out. Wait, they're about to show the title card. Ah, she missed it. We then get a glimpse inside the drawer of Jarl Swan III and see some pretty explicit photos. Charlie then gathers his ex's shoes into his car decorated with eggs and bacon before driving to the scenic overlook to toss them into this ravine. <sighs> Charlie's car has trouble driving over Dwayne Johnson and soon finds himself rolling down the ravine himself. Charlie takes carpooling literally before being rushed to the hospital and giving us our first immersive dream sequence. There's gonna be a lot of these. Now we're only 9 minutes into the movie, so I'm gonna be going a bit faster. Charlie has a vision of his own funeral before rising out of the grave. Charlie? Then he does the next logical thing, dances. <laughs> After this dance number plays out, Charlie wakes up at the hospital to his nephews trying to set a new high score. Go ahead and unplug it. I don't wanna live. Okay, you don't have to be that upset that they beat your score. We soon get to meet Jason Schwartzman's character, who is kind of the best part of this movie. <laughs> Charlie thinks back on his relationship and how he's always been imaginative. I've always been a daydreamer. I know that much. Before giving us an example. It would go something like this. You'd be there, and a bad guy would burst in and try to take you away. <laughs> Charlie fights off the Nazi and finishes with a flamethrower that doesn't seem like it would quite reach someone that's laying on the floor outside of the bus. Stay the fuck out. Okay, okay, jeez. Oh, Charlie, you're nuts. People. Well, do you borrow my brain for five seconds and just be like, dude, can't handle it. Unplug this bastard. Charlie is an artist and is doing the cover art for his friend's new album. They have a meeting over it, but it quickly turns into Charlie ruminating over his ex. Jason suggests that if he really wants to know what's going on, he could plan a bug on his ex to find out. The scene turns into another dream sequence. Isn't that weird to get clean in such dirty water? A brief chase ensues and Bill Murray shows up. Are you a man? In real life, Bill Murray is Charlie's account manager and shows up at the hospital to tell him that his financials aren't good. We get some more flashbacks of Charlie's recent relationship and him ruminating over his mixed feelings about it, before Jason suggests playing him his new stand-up bit to cheer him up. Do you want to hear my new bit? It's funny, it talks about all this shit. Here, listen. Now, we've all heard a lot about women's intuition. But what a lot of you don't know is that there is an organization called the SSBB, the Secret Society of Ball Busters. We get another dream sequence, this one showing the operations of this secret organization, and it's kind of a welcome reprieve from Charlie complaining about his relationship and helping us understand why she ended it. Mary Elizabeth Winston is in this sequence, and I really wish she had access to the surveillance equipment earlier when she met Scott Pilgrim and made it a much shorter film. I'll leave you alone forever now. Thanks. I think out of all the dream sequences, this one's definitely the best and is kind of funny throughout it. it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. The bullets are too small. Maybe the guns are too big. Back in real life, Charlie is let go from the hospital after a test show that everything's fine, and he goes home and has an argument with the girlfriend of his ghost, which sounds cool, but it just kind of feels like he's not really learning anything. I put them in the drawer so you wouldn't see them. That's just crap from my past. What the fuck are you going through my stuff for anyways? Although he does eventually apologize this time. I'm sorry, Bona. I really am. Charlie talks through his relationship with a few other people in his life before visiting Jason Schwartzman, and he gives us a surprisingly good song. Well Like I said, Schwartzman's the highlight of this movie. While here, Charlie picks up the spy equipment to eavesdrop on his ex. Charlie's ex had asked for her skiing equipment back, so that's where he hides the device, before heading out on the town dressed as one of the Blues Brothers. We also get a shot of him drinking and driving, in case he wasn't unlikable enough already. Alright, so these next few scenes just kind of happen, and they kind of call back to stuff that was mentioned earlier in the film, but they don't let you know what's about to happen, so they just kind of make sense as we're in the middle of it. But it still feels weird, but let's just get into it. Earlier in the movie, his sister mentions that the publishing company that published her first book isn't interested in publishing her new novel, so he goes over and smashes the front door. <laughs> Fortunately, he drives a very discreet and common car, but he ends up abandoning it anyway. He buys caviar from a taxi driver and then goes to his ex-girlfriend's house to spy on her, but quickly gets caught. Oh my god. 
it, it's my boyfriend behind that. She still takes time to talk with him when we get the most emotional scene of the movie. I'll meet someone and, and it won't be you. And I'll, I'll fall in love with her. And I'll have kids and a happy family and... And I won't love you like this anymore. I can't bear not loving you. And then much later, I'll see you again. And you'll have grown older and I'll be old. I don't want to not... And I love you. I could tell you that I hate you. That you mean nothing to me. And part of it's true. But part of it's not. Thank you for everything that you gave me. Charlie then heads over to his company's Christmas party, which is kind of crazy that this is all happening the same night. That he's like, oh, I'm gonna go to my company's Christmas party. But first, let me stop by the publisher and smash the front door. And yeah, I have time to get caviar, and then let me go stalk my ex-girlfriend. And I was like, well, I should probably head around and roll over to the Christmas party now. It's like, why did this all happen the same night? While there, things start to go his way, starting with him talking with his sister. I heard about what you did. Thank you for sticking up for me. The cops came looking for you. I told them that your car was stolen. Good thinking. Swan, I ran your numbers again, and things are not as dire as I originally thought. So there's hope for me? There's always hope. While there, he also runs into Jason Schwartzman's character, which the last time they talked, they got in a pretty heated argument. Merry Christmas, Kerm. I love you, man. Happy Hanukkah, Charlie. I love you too, brother. <laughs> However, the brewing out session gets interrupted because... We have some very important business to discuss in the conference room. Ladies and gentlemen, Little Charlie Swan the third Jr. Which I guess makes him Charles Swan the fourth. Now you might be thinking, I didn't know Charlie had a son, but it's so much better than that. Put the picture back in the ground. Watch out, Jason, you've got some competition for best part of the movie now. This also leads to Charlie being inspired, but how could you not be inspired by this? Kirby, I have an idea for your album cover. It just popped in my head. Yeah? Well, what is it? It's everything. Everything plus the kitchen sink. Charlie goes back to where he threw away his ex's shoes, so it's nice to see him turn around. Oh, nope. Right back into the ravine. The movie ends with the photo shoot for Jason Schwartzman's album cover featuring, as Charlie promised, everything plus the kitchen sink before giving us some very stylized closing credits. I'm Charlie Sheen and I play Charles Swan the third. I'm Jason Schwartzman and I play Kirby Star. I'm Bill Murray. I play Saul. I'm Liam Hayes and I wrote the music. I'm so happy that you're finally free. You jumped the fence. But you didn't take and so ends A Glimpse Inside the Mind of Charles Swan III, their very first film released by A24. But what are my first impressions of it? Let's get into it. So to summarize my first impressions after watching the movie, I'd say it's fine. Like, there's some interesting scenes, there's some surprisingly funny moments, but I think the main issue with the film is that the main character himself is very unlikable. Like, there's not really any redeeming qualities about him, and there's a scene that's like pretty heavily implied that he cheated on her. And a lot of the movie is just kind of him complaining about the relationship. And it's hard to tell if he truly loved her. Like, there's a lot of flashbacks and scenes of the relationship before it ended. But it's hard to tell or to really feel that it's anything distinct or different from other relationships that he's had. And so throughout it, it kind of feels like, did he genuinely love her, like, special? Or was this just kind of a narcissist dealing with someone not acting the way that they wanted him to? And so at the end, it's also very unfulfilling when he has that argument with her and they have this conversation and it's kind of like the most emotional scene. And it feels like it's just kind of like, oh, OK, this thing happened. And then it doesn't really feel like he really turned around and like changed his ways. But then the movie just kind of like says that everything's good now and everything goes his way. But it's kind of like. You can only tell that things are better because the music is like a lot more upbeat and positive now and everything starts working out for him. But it's like he didn't really do anything to fix the problems that he had. 
he just had this conversation with his ex that only happened because he was stalking her with spy equipment. And then it suddenly it's like, hey, your finances, they're not as bad as I thought. Oh, hey, man, we're such best friends. I love you, man. And then his sister that like, it seems like he's going through these like very immature processes of like smashing the front door of the publishing company that refused that turned down his sister that we don't really know anything about why she got turned down. It seems like it's pretty reasonable. And he goes and like breaks the front door. And then his sister's like, I heard about what you did. Thanks for standing up for me. It's like, that's not the reaction he should be getting. But like, he didn't really do any work the whole time. Like, he comes up with the idea for the photo for the album cover. But like, that wasn't really part of everything getting fixed. And then that happens and it just kind of ends. And it's like, yep, everything's good now. It's like, it doesn't feel like anything happened or anything positive worked out. It just feels like the universe just said, like, okay, he's good now and everything's taken care of. Some of the positives, there are some surprisingly funny moments. The dream sequences, they're not consistently good or, like, a lot of the time they're very superfluous and sometimes not even really entertaining. But it's something that's different and distinct about the movie, so that's nice. And some of the interesting scenes, like, at the beginning when he has this sequence of him being at the funeral and then he comes out of the grave and dances with everyone... It's not super well executed, and it's not like, man, this is awesome. But it's something that's interesting and that I haven't really seen before. And that's kind of why I like indie movies, is that they're distinct. They're not generic and feel like they played it safe. It's something that wasn't super like, yeah, this is amazing. But I definitely watched something unique and risk-taking like that, rather than just watching something that really plays it safe and I've seen before. And like I said, the scene with the secret organization is kind of the highlight of the film. It's one, definitely one of the funniest scenes throughout it. But then also the puppet of Charles Swan IV is definitely one of the most exciting, like, funny moments of the film. So there's some good moments throughout it, but it's kind of bogged down by this really not exciting story that just feels very drawn out and not meaningful. And then it tries to, like, really say that they nailed it at the end, even though it didn't feel like they did at really any point throughout it. And so while there are some pretty funny moments, there are movies out there that are quite a bit funnier than it and don't have half the movie kind of be this part that you sort of have to ignore throughout it. And so it's tough to recommend this movie, but I mean, if you have 90 minutes to kill and the only thing available is a DVD copy of A Glimpse Inside the Mind of Charles Swan III, it's decent. But when it comes to competing with other movies, there's not a lot of reason to choose this one over others. I don't want the series to just be me watching the movie once and then giving you my initial underbaked impressions of it. I really want to dive deep and learn as much about the film as I can. And so to get started, I went to the special features on the disc, starting with this making of behind the scenes feature that's about 25 minutes long. And throughout it, there are some interesting details. Some of it's kind of just like good to know, but not really essential. Some of the highlights is that it starts with the director, Roman Coppola, who I'll refer to as Roman from now on. It talks about his reverence for the pop art and how much he likes it in general. And so that was like a big inspiration for the movie. And then he's actually friends with the artist that the movie is based on, Charlie White III. And there's a separate feature about him specifically that we'll get to later. But talking through the movie, that art style, it's something he really wanted to include. But that style, that airbrush look to it. It's something that's actually kind of hard to create in Photoshop, so they ended up using a lot of the original pictures that they that Roman was inspired by, and I prefer that over this like modern recreation of that. And so that's something that's kind of unintended is a challenge that they ran into, but I th feel like it ended up making it better rather than being inspired by this thing and showing us this like different take on it. They spent some time praising the director and some of the actors in it. And it kind of goes on a bit long of just like, oh yeah, this guy, he's so great. Man, he's so great. He's so great. Next actor. I oh, mean, that guy, he's so great. He's so great. And it's like, okay, I kind of get it. But when they talk about Roman, they talk about him pretty positively. And also how he's like very chill. He's calm. He's not someone that like, he never got angry on set and stuff like that. And so that's nice to know. Like anytime a movie's made, if it's not good, but like they at least had a, a good time making the film, it's like, okay, that's kind of nice at least. And if the movie is good, it's like, yeah, they also had enjoyed making it as a good working environment. It's like, okay, nice, even better. So always a positive thing. 
And I will say, though, that I feel like the featurette, just the making of it, it was probably recorded during the production of the film. So I feel like you wouldn't get someone talking bad about the director while the movie production is still ongoing. But it definitely feels like they have enough positive st stuff to say about him that they're not just all making it up. And one interesting thing about the production of the film is that there's that scene where they're sitting at a table before it explodes during that Secret Society of Ballbusters scene. And for that scene, they use practical effects. That's mostly just propane that like ex like bursts and has the flame effect. But they're actually sitting at a the table that explodes as they're running away from it. And so when they're sitting there, Charlie Sheen and Jason Schwartzman, one of them was like, yeah, so we're just kind of like sitting next to a bomb, huh? And they're like, why would you say that? And because it's all propane, they were able to do a few takes of it pretty easily. But it was multiple takes of them actually running away from a fireball. And part of it, Jason Schwartzman's like, yeah, I thought the back of my coat was on fire, but I guess it's not, so we're fine. It's like, oh yeah, that is like a bit more intense than I would have predicted. Also in that scene, they have this set of the secret like headquarters of the society. And I like the look of it. It's very like old futuristic look. And that set was designed that the ceiling is basically just these $4 ceiling tiles that they found and just bought a ton of them and made the set from it. So that was interesting to know. And seeing the production of actually building the control console, just seeing someone like cut pieces of cardboard and stack it up. Whenever I see a movie, it feels like something that's like super high budget, something that is so far away from being attainable or being able to recreate myself. And then just seeing someone stack pieces of cardboard to make the console, it's kind of like, oh, this feels a bit more feasible than I would have anticipated. And also during that scene, there's like a part that they get in a toy helicopter. But because of the scaling and the kind of like the aesthetic of the set overall, it kind of fits. The end scene where they're on the beach and they do the photo shoot, they were actually planning to have an actual pool like set into the sand rather than just have this like forced perspective illusion for the actual like album cover. But I feel like I liked it a lot more that it is this forced perspective thing. But the movie, it's a lot of this like fantasy dreamlike illusion scenes. And so seeing the end, that's like, oh, this looks real. And then they just break that illusion in front of you. I felt like that felt more thematic. They do talk about sometimes the budget was limiting, but it felt like they made a better movie because of that. And I had already been thinking that before they said it. So I was glad that they agree with it. Overall, the behind the scenes making a feature at I feel like there's some pretty interesting stuff. I really like movies and like I said, it always feels so unattainable. So seeing the actual like work behind it and kind of how easily they were able to trick us into thinking it was this high budget thing. I thought it was pretty interesting. I think for this movie, like they never really talk about the plot or the themes of the film. They mention how the eggs and bacon on his car is something that they just added because it seemed interesting and like if you saw that, you'd be like, oh, the person that drives that must be an interesting kind of person. Which I was glad that they were pretty transparent about, like, yeah, it doesn't really mean a whole lot. Just that was kind of neat. I still feel like the plot wasn't really a focus of the production. Kind of more of a second after that. But seeing the actual making of did kind of make me, kind of impress me with some of the scenes. How easy, like I said, that they were able to, like, trick us into thinking that was a higher production. And just kind of seeing some more of the passion behind it. I don't think it's really going to change my opinion of the movie, of being like, oh, you know what? Now that I see it this way, this is really good and like a lot better than I initially thought, but interesting to learn about. The next special feature on this disc is this interview kind of mini documentary about the artist that the character of Charles Swan III is based on, which is Charles White III. And it's kind of interesting to know more about the process of making the art and the like art scene at that time. But it's not really anything that changes your experience watching the film. It kind of gives you more background, but not any different meaning. And so some of the highlights, I'll go through this a bit more quickly. His airbrush style and stuff like that was something that's pretty distinct and popular at the time. But one really interesting piece they did was he did a Star Wars poster that I hadn't really seen before. But apparently the studio was basically like, hey, we want this like 40s style poster of the film and like that was the only requirement there wasn't anything about blocking or anything like that so he made the poster and on the final one you can see that's like it looks like an image of a poster on the wall somewhere and that wasn't intended originally it's supposed to just be that like actual poster in the picture but they needed to add more text at the bottom of it so to make space they basically had to shrink it down and then filled in that empty space with this like wall look 
And so I thought that was pretty interesting, even though I hadn't seen that Star Wars poster before. And going through it, one thing, though, is that he mentions that he, like, saw a billboard for something. It was like, oh, man, it'd be cool to have my own billboard. So he called up the place and was like, yeah, I want to, like, get one. And they're like, oh, you can't just get one. You have to get at least five. And he's like, okay, I'll get five. So he just put up these billboards with a photo of him that says Charles White the Third rules the world. And he mentions that he's like, yeah, you know, I didn't pit, like, what I do, like, how to contact me on it. It was just kind of like this billboard. And so it really didn't feel thought through and not a good investment, especially buying five of them. But he was like, yeah, I think that really, like, defined my style of, like, being ballsy and stuff like that. And like I mentioned, he's actually friends with Roman Coppola, which, you know, makes a lot more sense if you're going to base a whole movie around him. But the thing is, I feel like if someone's like, hey, I'm making this movie with this character based on you, and I saw a glimpse inside the mind of Charles Swanth III, I'm like, that guy, the character is so unlikable that I'd be a bit offended. And then during this, like, mini interview feature, he goes, yeah, I feel like they nailed my personality pretty well. I was like, that's your true personality is this guy that like cheats on his girlfriend and then complains about relationships for the whole movie without really growing at all. So that felt a bit weird, but you know, at least now I kind of know more about pop art, I guess. So the last thing on the disc to experience to really get the most comprehensive experience I can from the movie itself is to watch the movie again with the director's commentary audio on it. And there's some interesting things throughout it. The house that the character lives in is actually Roman's house that they used to film in because of budget reasons. And the shoes that he's packing up at the beginning, his Charlie's ex's shoes are actually Roman's girlfriend's shoes. And so it's mostly just kind of interesting production notes of how connected everyone is. Or anytime you see someone, it's like, oh, this is actually like my friend's daughter and stuff like that. They do mention some of the themes that I didn't really pick up. And one thing is that he, the character, Charlie, he likes these exotic things, but he doesn't really maintain them. And so one of the examples is his car that rolls down the hill, and that's because the brakes don't work on it, which isn't exactly what I assumed when it happened. But this also kind of leads to something else that I had a little bit of an issue with. And throughout the movie, he mentions this toucan a few times that he's giving his will, he's like recording it, and he's like, I want my toucan to go to a zoo that can take care of it properly. And later on, there's a part where he wakes up, he's having breakfast, and he like picks up the toucan. Later on in the movie, there's a scene where the toucan dies, he's burying it, and he's like, oh, another bad thing that's happened to me. And it just felt like they added a sad scene for the sake of having a sad scene. But apparently it was supposed to add on to that theme of him having these, or like desiring these exotic things, but not maintaining them and so it became a little bit more forgivable with that intent behind it but it still doesn't feel like it conveyed that idea because when the toucan dies he's not near it there's not anything that shows him feeding it something that he shouldn't be it's just he has this toucan and then there's a scene that the toucan's dead and it doesn't feel like it's his fault at all so it just kind of felt unnecessary but at least now i kind of know what they were going for with it. But some other production notes that are interesting, that dance scene, Charlie did a lot of rehearsing for it. They still used a dance double for some of the takes and then merged it together, which I'm not surprised because I can't imagine anyone being 47 years old and doing this dance move, much less Charlie Sheen. You know, I got tiger blood. Man. All right, calm down. And apparently Jason Schwartzman is cousins with Roman, which kind of makes sense that he's in it. But one thing that does kind of make me appreciate the craft or the art of the film a little bit more is that a lot of scenes with Jason Schwartzman were improvised along with Bill Murray's scenes. And so some of the funniest moments in the movie were just completely improvised. And one scene, they're going through a car wash, Charlie and his girlfriend that he's trying to get over. And during the scene, you can see them arguing, but you can't hear the audio at all. And so to help the characters get fired up and commit and make the scene more convincing, they were just arguing about basketball. And apparently the opening scene that's on this like black soundstage they kind of weren't planning to have that, but they wanted to get this tax credit that to be eligible for it, they had to begin filming before a certain date. So before they even did the principal photography, they just recorded that scene. And one thematic thing that I did think was interesting that I probably wouldn't have picked up on if it wasn't for the director's commentary, or at least not so blatantly, is that throughout the film, Charlie's character is like always wearing these sunglasses. And there's one part that he's in the shower, and so he's not wearing them. 
but during that scene he keeps his eyes closed so you basically never see his eyes correctly i did feel like that was something that was thematically interesting that added on to the movie and something that i maybe would have noticed oh he seems to wear the glasses a lot but not that you never see him with his glasses off and that when he does have it off he has his eyes closed However, watching through with this director's commentary, I still wanting more about the theme and the meaning behind the movie overall, instead of just, oh, this is my friend, this is my friend's cousin, this is my friend's kids. Doesn't make me feel like knowing all of this, I'm more forgiving of the movie overall, or that it really changes my opinion on things, other than the toucan meaning being something that's like a little more forgivable, that they're going for something that didn't work, rather than just pitting in something sad just to be sad. That and the sunglasses being constantly on were kind of the two things that make me think the movie's better than I thought it was before. Otherwise, it's just kind of interesting movie production trivia. Now, while I was still left feeling like the theme of the movie wasn't very strong or developed, one source that helped clarify kind of why this was was this Vice interview where he says, You know, it's interesting because I don't really see myself as a writer. I don't either. I'm really writing more as a filmmaker, like, oh, I want to make this movie. And so I'm not really thinking about the word. In fact, a lot of times when I was directing on the set, I wasn't even referring to the script because I was operating the camera, I didn't even have it, and then I would go home and say, oh shit, I forgot to do something because I wasn't paying attention to the script. So the script to me is not precious or any kind of goal into itself. And that kind of tracks with the final product of the film. I feel like with A24 films, they're a lot more complex and opaque than typical films that you just watch once and you understand everything. And so, now that I've done this research and gained a lot more understanding and familiarity with the film, it's time to watch it once again from the very beginning. Zing! Rewind! So I just rewatched A Glimpse Inside the Mind of Charles Swan III. And rewatching it, some things were a little bit better, but quite a few things were worse. So, let's go through it. One thing that stood out more was the music in the movie, and the music in it is pretty good. This is actually the foundation for the film, that Roman listened to the music a lot and kind of built the movie around that, and so it's good that it has a pretty solid foundation. However, what they built on top of that isn't really the same level of quality. While watching the movie, the plot is still bad, and at first it's kind of a little bit more forgivable because I wasn't expecting anything of it anymore, but then, with most of the movie, a lot of the dialogue is just Charlie complaining about his ex and women in general, and it becomes pretty grating after a while, especially coming from the character that cheated on her is not likable at all, and so it just becomes pretty tiring pretty quickly. The movie overall is also just hornier than a meatloaf song, and that being paired with all of the dialogue that's complaining about women and this every fantasy scene involving scantily clad women, it just doesn't feel good, and it continues on throughout the whole movie. And I think it'd be different if his character was kind of presented as, like, this bad guy that's a satire take on it. Instead, it just feels like he's not good, the movie keeps going, and then things work out for him and turns out well. And it, it doesn't feel like he develops at all or changes his ways. It just feels like he's still the same person, but now he's kind of treated as this good guy that is like very suave even though he's just kind of like pretty sleazy and i will say one thing that felt more developed though is that in the flashbacks with the ex that he's trying to get over she mentions like oh do you think it's silly to dream of being an actor like early on in their relationship and then closer to the present time she's taking acting lessons and he goes oh, i should have encouraged her and stuff like that but this background dream of being an actor was surprisingly developed i didn't notice that the first time watching it I felt like there's some other things that they mention and then gets brought up later in the movie that kind of surprised me. One other thing that kind of makes it worse, I forgot there's a scene where his ex, after he spies on her and has that whole heart-to-heart -heart conversation, if you can call it that, she goes, oh, and I want my shoes back. And he goes, oh yeah, your shoes, sure thing. So then after that scene that everything's good now, he goes to get the shoes and then tosses them into the ravine again, completely unnecessarily. And so it feels like he just doubled down on it being a bad person and then we get that scene at the end where thumb on the beach and seeing everything's happy and it just feels like what's going on like it feels like such a disconnect between the character and his motives and his intent and the way he's being rewarded and the tone that the movie says is happening right now 
And so it just feels really messy and not cohesive at all. I want to say that there's some funny parts and that's what is worth watching. Like when I'm watching the movie, that's what I'm like waiting for most of the time. But the last third of the movie is kind of the hardest part because that's where the least funny moments happen, the least dream sequences. And it just ends on this very tone deaf message or like takeaway from it. And so at the end of the day, while watching it, I also feel like Roman Coppola is just making a movie for himself. It's not really accessible to mass audiences. And so I, I can appreciate the passion he has for certain aspects of the movie, like pop art from the 70s and stuff like that. But at the same time, it just feels too disconnected or like it almost feels like it's a social class that's like too high. That's like not relatable anymore. That is just all this stuff that is kind of living this like crazy lifestyle and it's kind of displayed as this way of like yeah this is interesting and cool and stuff like that and then watching it's just kind of like this feels very sad and a little sleazy and the movie doesn't seem to acknowledge that in any way not even in a tongue-in-cheek way it just almost kind of goes yeah that's cool and then has a happy ending even though there's nothing that led up to it so Overall, not great. There's a few funny moments, but it's not worth watching the whole movie just to get to. So that's kind of my thoughts overall after rewatching the film. Now, even though the movie was pretty bad overall, as I go through this series watching various A24 films, I want to highlight my favorite aspects of each one. So let's go ahead and find the best glimmers from the glimpse inside the mind of Charles Swan III. Let's start with my favorite scene for the movie. And for that, I'd have to give it to the end sequence because it means the movie is finally over. Alright, I'm not that harsh on the movie, but I did really enjoy this sequence because I love movies, but I'm always aware that actors on screen with all these people working behind the scenes to make this production come together to tell the story. And so when the movie just acknowledges that and gets to have the actors just kind of talk to the audience for a moment and everyone take a bow, I just really enjoy that. And it's something that I've seen before, like at the end of the music video for Like a Prayer. And I felt like it was done pretty well here, although it's a little bit soured by the ending that happened right before it. That feels very unearned, but the scene itself is still really enjoyable. I think my second choice would have been the whole Secret Society of Ballbusters dream sequence, because that's like the highlight of the whole dream gimmick throughout the movie. And for once, it feels like the movie's self-aware enough to make fun of itself and accept that. Next, let's take a look at my favorite shot for the movie. And for that, I'm going to give it to the part where Charlie Sheen rises out of the grave. I felt like it was a, almost a little bit eerie and very tonally different from the rest of the film, but with it being a dream sequence, I felt like it didn't break the movie and showed off a pretty cool effect. Now with each movie in the series, I want to highlight my favorite line from them, but I feel like with this one it's kind of hard to find something worth highlighting. I feel like typically it would have been that dialogue at the end of the movie, that emotional scene with his ex-girlfriend, but I feel like the scene's good out of context, but knowing the character and what's been going on with them before then, the whole message of the scene just kind of rings hollow. There's also a line where Bill Murray says, Desire is about as close to happiness as I'm gonna get. And again, I feel like it sounds good out of context, but he's talking about being an old guy wanting to sleep with as many young women as he can. And so again, in context, it just doesn't feel good. And so I want to give it to a funny line because I feel like that's the best aspect of the movie, but I kind of have trouble thinking of one single line that's quotable and funny in itself rather than being very context dependent. And so I think I'll end up giving it to And finally, I want to highlight my favorite character in the movie. And this one's actually kind of tough because Charles Swan IV is pretty up there, but I'm going to have to give it to Jason Schwartzman's character, Kirby Starr. Guess we're going to have to lasso. Now I'm still figuring out the format as I go, so expect some changes in the next few episodes, including what the categories are, but for now, I'm going to cap it off there. The budget for A Glimpse Inside the Mind of Charles Swan III was $12 million, and at the box office, it made $210,565, so not even close. However, the movie was only released in 18 theaters in the US for only about two weeks, and it actually made most of its money in Russia. Now this is strictly box office, so it's not accounting for streaming or DVD sales, although I'm a little doubtful that's going to add up to $11,800,000. The movie also didn't do very well critically, so not a great debut for A24. Fortunately, A24 didn't produce this movie, they only handled the distribution for it. 
And while a glimpse inside the mind of Charles Swan III has some interesting ideas, it stumbles a lot more than it runs. But when A24 finds its stride, it's unstoppable. A24 has gone on to make a huge name for itself in the movie industry, but did it get here by having success after success? Or by having a few notable victories and a lot of hidden defeats? We'll be exploring that throughout the series from A to 24. And so that's going to conclude the first episode of From A to 24, covering A Glimpse Inside the Mind of Charles Swan III. Now this is going to be a weekly series, so make sure you subscribe so you get notified when next week's episode comes out, covering Ginger and Rosa, a movie that I know nearly nothing about at the moment, but I'll be getting pretty familiar with it over the next week. Now as I mentioned, I'm kind of figuring out the format of the series as I go, so don't be too surprised if next week's episode is quite a bit different from this one. I feel pretty satisfied with the movie recap part of it, but I feel like the rest of the video is just kind of a lot of me talking to the camera. And so I might combine part of that with the movie recap, so as we go through the movie, you get my thoughts on it, the initial review, or kind of include some of the details I learned from the deep dive, but I'll give it some thought. I'd like to add more editing to the like rest of the video, where it's not just me talking to the camera for consistent long shots, but it's kind of hard to fit in a lot more editing with watching the movie like three times at minimum, and doing the rest of the research into the film and doing it within a week. But we'll see what happens and figure it out as I go. Already, I'll probably be making the deep dive portion a bit more concise and less long-winded, just so that it's not spending so long on each part of it with the director's commentary and each special feature. But I'll figure it out as I go, and feel free to give me some feedback on what you want to see more of or what can be kind of cut down. And so, that's going to wrap up the debut episode of the new series from 8 to 24. I'm Leviatross, and I play Leviatross. I'm so happy that you're finally free. You jumped the fence, but you didn't take me.